tonight we're going to hear a lot about science and the knowledge it's created. You might also hear a bit about wisdom. And we're sitting here together in this building that immortalizes the science that's generated knowledge that changes the way we live our lives in a day-to-day -day way. So I thought, what better place, what better night than to talk about knowledge and wisdom, knowing and doing. Knowledge is our understanding of the world around us, whereas wisdom is defined as our ability to act upon that understanding. And so it would be natural to believe that there's a harmonious relationship between these two things. And yet in my field of environmental policy and planning, there is a wide gap often between knowing and doing. And so I'll tell you tonight about my journey of discovering this gap and a solution I've come up with for trying to narrow it. So here I am, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, about 10 years ago, believing it was a simple task to create some knowledge and create some change. I'd just come back from the field in the Northern Territory where I was working on some science to design a private land conservation program. And I thought, this is simple. It's applied research. I'm solving a problem that needs to be solved. All I need to do is make it to the top of this summit of knowledge I've created, shake hands with the policymaker, deliver that knowledge, and they will have the wisdom to act upon it. And yet, <laughs> I got to this summit and discovered it wasn't a mountain at all. It was, in fact, a canyon, and here I was on the edge of it, and far away on the other side were those who needed to enact upon this. And so I had to think about how do I bridge this gap between knowing and doing. And so I thought about this. Some of you may have seen the TEDx talk by Simon Sinek. And he says, to inspire action, you must always start with the why. He goes on to tell us and draw some concentric circles that once you've answered the why, you can go on to think about the how. And lastly, you can think about the what. And I thought, OK, well, that's simple. Perhaps my problem was I started with the what, private land conservation. Let's do this. Let's answer these questions. And so I answered the why. Here we are in the Daily Catchment, where I spent a lot of time in the Northern Territory. It is some of the world's most intact remaining savanna. It is home to plants and animals you'll only find here. And it's the foundations for the grazing industry, which is a really important part of the economy in Northern Australia. So what we need to do is enable land managers to change the practices to improve the environment, and by doing this, it'll improve their businesses. And then the what is a private land conservation program that provides financial incentives to these land managers to allow them to change their practices. And this will sustain a healthy environment and in turn, improve their businesses. And my research shows the best part of this is it actually comes in at about one-tenth of the cost of delivering similar types of management in national parks. So it saves the government money. Great. I've done the why, I've done the how, I've done the what. Do we have a private land conservation program in the Northern Territory? No. <laughs> so I had to question, what, what's going wrong here? I followed this very simple formula. I've put forward a compelling argument. Why are we not enacting upon this knowledge? And the answer I came up with is that the first thing you have to start with is who. Who has to enact upon this knowledge? And once you've found that who, you can answer the question why. And so I returned to the Northern Territory and did some more work. And I thought, well, the who in this case is the people who live and own on this land. They have to participate in these programs. They have to be a part of this change. So we need to understand their why. And so we talked to farmers. We went to their properties, and we asked them about how they manage their land, what they might want to do on their farms, how they would change their practices if they were to participate in this type of program. And we also talked to traditional owners about What's important to them on their land? What do they want to see change? How might they engage in this type of program? And we understood a lot more about what this program would need to look and feel like. And we thought, great, I've found a who, and I've answered the why. So do we have a private land conservation program in the Northern Territory? The answer is still no. But this was a really important moment, a learning moment. So I think the equation is certainly still who, and then why? But there was actually a big asterisk next to that who. And that's that you have to be prepared to pull back the layers and discover new who's. The problem here is we'd only identified half of that equation. 
the people who have to be part of the change, who have to be part of that program. I hadn't adequately spoken to the people who have to implement that change, who have to design that program, and that's the government. So we needed to have longer and more meaningful conversations with that who. So, armed with this new equation, I'll take you now to the coast, just northeast of the Daly, to Kakadu National Park. And this is Ubir Rock, deep within the park, standing looking out across the floodplain. Some of you may have been in this exact spot. Kakadu National Park is a World Heritage Area declared for its cultural and environmental significance. It's our largest national park in Australia. It is a beautiful place. The floodplains are full of life. They are home to many plants and animals, migratory birds that come and visit them. The problem is they're threatened by invasive grasses. And these grasses, as they take hold, choke up these waterways. And they displace the native plants that are home and food to these animals. And so we need to do something about this. I was very lucky to be part of a very large research team in this case. And these were researchers who are very much embedded in this place and had a good idea of the many different who's we might need to talk to. And so we started by having conversations with the traditional owners who live and manage this place. We asked them about what parts of the floodplain are important to them, how they use these places, what changes they've observed, and what they think needs to happen. We talked to the managers who have to be out on these floodplains 365 days a year, implementing these management actions. We asked them, where could you get to on these floodplains? How would you manage these problems? What do they think is possible and what's not? What would they need in a plan to help them guide these activities? And lastly, this is a Commonwealth National Park. So we needed to talk to Parks Australia as part of the government to say, what do you need in a plan to deliver on your legislative obligations for this place? And so at the end of all of those conversations, we had a set of strategies that everyone believed held the solution for this place. If followed, this will protect these floodplains. And so while we may not have that exact strategy in place on ground, it's an ongoing process and we're closer than ever to having knowing become doing. The last piece of that puzzle is having more conversations with a different set of actors within the government to find the money to make this a reality. But we're getting there. And so I'll return to Ubir Rock. If we want to protect places like this, we have to bridge that gap between knowledge and wisdom. We have to follow a formula of finding the who's, answering their why's, and remembering that final ingredient, time and commitment to peel back the layers of the who's, to discover new people and have new conversations. And if we do that, knowing really will become doing, we can close that gap between knowledge and wisdom. Thank you.